Welcome to Modular March. I'm Andy, this is Robbie, and we are The Roll-Up. Modular March is an educational experience about all things modular. Enjoy. Modular March. Today we have Ilya, the co-founder of Near Protocol. Also was seen with a very interesting hobby in conferences. Perhaps he can share his hobbies with us. We have Robbie as well. Ilya, welcome to Modular March and thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for inviting. Great to be here. And uh, looking forward to learning about chain abstraction. I think you guys have pioneered this concept. When you think of chain abstraction, you think of Near. So very excited to kind of learn more and try to poke some holes in your thesis, sir. So when you're ready to go, we, we will go. Sounds good. And let's do Abstracted April next. So, uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah. So let me introduce kind of the concept and, uh, you know, dive in into some of the tech behind it. Um, I mean, the reason why this is really important, especially now, is that actually Web3 is becoming even more fragmented. Um, we, we see applications who are kind of need to think about multi-chain from the start because whatever chain you launch in, you kind of highly limit your addressable market, right? Like you only target users with that chain and then, you know, acquiring users from other chains is like extremely expensive. And so you don't want to be limited by that. The fragmentation of like experience, I don't know how about you guys, but I have like more networks in my MetaMask than can fit on the screen. You know, I have like Near Wallet, Solana Wallet, I have like Kepler, I have Bitcoin Wallet. So like, it's just like insane number of things that like I need to handle. And then I have a bunch of addresses on every chain as well, right? For different things. And obviously, you know, liquidity, everybody's talking about, like it's really hard to move. Uh, new rollups are launching every day. They don't have a bridge yet. You know, like the withdrawals are long, like it, it's all kind of super complicated ton of accounts, ton of wallets. And then you, you as user, actually, it's really hard to like, if you're not like a 100%, you know, full-time DGN who is like, you know, tracking everything, you know, where move money are moving on chain. Like it's hard to find these opportunities and like, what are the new cool apps launching? It's hard to like keep track of all of this. And so how about instead of like defragmenting, we like aggregate everything and kind of abstract, right? So instead of wallet on every chain, we want just one wallet for all chains, right? I mean, pretty simple kind of idea, but not just wallet, we want one account. So like the, be that uh, account that user owns or a smart contract that you can actually write and navigate the whole space. And that's really what kind of we introduced this chain abstraction movement. Uh, there's a ton of people actually like gathering around it. You know, a lot of Ethereum folks obviously aligned with this. Cosmos have been thinking about it from the start uh, as well. Uh, or like uh, recently, and uh, you know we see that kind of starting to to gain momentum around uh, other other ecosystems as well. And the reality is like all of these things that people are talking about, like are, you know obviously there's modularity, aggregation, there's intense orchestration. It is all chain abstraction, right? Because chain abstraction is what we're trying to achieve. Those are the ways we are achieving it, right? Those are the hows, um, and so. You know, aggregation, like for example, Polygon is uh, doing like a glare and kind of uh, is a way to aggregate liquidity to allow to chain abstract over. Intents are allowing for someone to pretty much say what they want without explaining how exactly it will be executed. And then you can have somebody on the back end doing it. Modularity is a way to kind of launch a lot of, you know, independent uh, environments, but then you need to abstract them out to kind of provide this experience. So, for us, actually, this journey started from the start. I think when we started near, one of the main points that I was driving is like, I don't want to kind of figure out blockchain when I'm starting to use block, like when I'm starting to use applications, right? Like we were trying to simplify the onboarding experience, the usage, kind of remove as much of the terminology and kind of complexity, you know, hashes in your face as much as possible. 
And for Near itself, Near is actually a multi-chain chain itself, right? We have different shards, and actually, even each contract itself is kind of like a like independent chain, and we just bundle them together. And so we actually been even abstracting that from developers and users, right? You you need to go really deep to understand how many shards we have. For example, we just added one more shard. You know, uh, network just added more capacity but nothing changed for developers and users on top of it, right? You don't need to like do anything yourself because of that. So that's kind of the, you know, the basis of chain abstraction is like, you don't need to think about it. You can easily onboard. Uh, we've worked a lot on account, our near account abstraction kind of from the main net. Uh, how do we make it simple for people to rotate keys to, you know, kind of uh, interact with contracts um, in a limited capacity so you can have like independent front end doing that. So all of that kind of experience now we want to bring to all chains, right? So instead of just on near kind of in, in, um, in somewhat again, limited target market and, and, and economy, we now bring all of that to the whole ecosystem, uh, in web three. <coughs> and so the cool thing is, uh, there's a whole stack of things that like near has that uh, are useful for others, right? So obviously we have, you know, super scalable layer one that uh, scales with sharding, meaning as like, for example, we had sounds of congestion on the network. Uh, we actually added one more shard. We're planning to add one more shard again uh, in, in, a f in a few days as well. So like we can continue growing capacity, you know, continue uh, doing things in parallel. Uh, we have near data availability. So again, data availability being something that near had from the day one, it's like in the original, you know, nightshade paper. And uh, it's really how the nears kind of shards uh, pretty much working. And so now we can offer that to other rollups, to other uh, kind of uh, chains that need it. Similarly, near has a fast finality layer. Uh, and so we're partnering with Eigenlayer to actually offer that for other uh, layer twos and rollups. And uh, to aggregate security to actually allow to have uh, kind of more provability. Uh, we're working with Polygon on ZK Wasm Prover, which allowed to actually prove the near chain itself, right? So we can have like one ZK proof for near, but also it's actually extremely useful, even non blockchain use cases. Wasm is used across, you know, your browser that we use right now, uh, you know, on edge, like Adobe Photoshop used it for, for example, a lot of the compression mechanisms and then uh, video processing. And so like all of that is like extremely useful primitives that are useful for rollups, for kind of app chains and kind of connect everything into this uh, aggregate security aggregation stack. And so really so quick, this, yeah, if you don't mind, I was at the, there was this event in De um, Denver called Modulitic Debate with, you know, some Solana people and Dax guy and uh, Celestia and Clips and, Basically, there was this there was this concept of these like basically L ones or monolithic chains or you know single state machines for a better term scaling in a modular fashion to scale their kind of L, initial L one. Do you view that adding shards into your L one for years L one as kind of scaling the the single state machine or, or the monolithic L one in a modular fashion or or kind of how do you think about adding shards? Is that like a, an appropriate uh, kind of term? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because obviously, I mean, all these terms are just like a shortcut for something, right? So I think modularity, I mean, it, it is a a shortcut for, for this idea that you can kind of add more capacity to the network, but at the same time for Ethereum, right? But at the same time, it really doesn't um, kind of answer the question of like, how does the experience work, right? And so that's why we talk about chain abstraction. For near, we started with how does experience work, and then added the you know the capacity part behind the scene. That's why for us sharding, I mean sharding is like a concept from like computer science and you know databases that you know been existing around for a long time. Like for us, sharding is kind of it's it's hidden from the user, right? Like modularity right now is in your face, right? You need to choose where you're going. You know, you need to check which like data availability it uses to make sure it's not like gonna steal your money. You know, you're like L2 beat, you know, every day, if like they switched or something uh, um, versus for near its idea was like, okay, well, you have the experience, you have the guarantees that are the same, like by near network. And then sharding is just allowing to scale this capacity. Now, 
fundamentally it's the same primitive. The primitive is that you want to do parallel processing of transactions and you need more computers doing parallel processing to process more transactions. Uh, but I, like, I generally don't call it modularity. So, but at the same time, like near is kind of integrated chain from experience perspective and in a way like modular slash, you know, sharded chain on the back end that actually allows to have this scale. And then just to follow up on that, can, can you just continue to add shards in a trust minimized manner for perpetuity? I mean, there is obviously like speed of light and other uh, kind of limitations uh, <laughs> and like just throughput of the network. Um, so we are uh, we are upgrading to stateless validation in May. So right now we have some like, I don't know, 8, 10 shard limit based on just like capabilities of some nodes. We are adding uh, stateless validation. So like it's on testnet right now. It's been kind of uh, exercised in our incentivized uh, testnet. Uh, and we're launching this somewhere on May. And so that actually will allow us to add a lot more shards. So like, because we don't now, like we don't need uh, the same kind of level of uh, some validators kind of va still validating a bunch of shards. Now we can have, uh, you know, a lot more shards because any validator now can validate any shard because they don't need to have state, right? They don't need to sync state. They can just like take a block validate it on its own. So we can rotate validators all the time between shards. We can have a lot more validators in general to do this. And now we can actually expand number of shards uh, larger. Now, probably at like, you know, 100 plus shards, there are going to be other bottlenecks that we're going to work on. But like kind of the idea is like we can continue scaling the network and, you know, find the bottlenecks and, and resolve them. But like generally speaking, you know, the sharding mechanism allows to continue scaling at its as if we took the you know model architecture of all the rollups and then just kind of put a you know aggregator ar around them that kind of you know make sure they settle all within uh, in our case one second every, every, like every lock and then have all the cross uh, cross rollup messaging and everything else packaged into that system. All right, so for data availability, I mean, so just for context again, so near itself, when near produces different shards, they are erasure coded, they send out to other validators. This allows to, you know, scale kind of uh, the amount of data we can put through the network with more shards. Uh, and so what this allows to do is as a role, like if you are running rollup, you can post data into near network, kind of as if you were, you know, near block producer as well. Uh, it gets, you know, erasure coded, sequenced, kind of, and like sent out. And then we have guarantees around our validators that, you know, um, that they're going to maintain the uh, this data for a period of time. And so we then have a way to prove it on Ethereum that this data was published on near and kind of under near uh, security guarantees is there. And so you can use that to settle, you know, ZK proof or optimistic proofs on, on Ethereum uh, that data was published. And so that's kind of like, you know, very, very simple diagram, but again, this really uses the existing kind of power of near and allows to like that data ability to continue to scale. Um, and in a way, again, makes this rollups like in a way also work in parallel to near shards, right? You know, you can think of them kind of running in parallel, um, to existing near shards. Uh, while also still have the security guarantees of Ethereum through the whatever proving mechanism they use. And so the cool thing here is because we have, you know, uh, we had four shards. We actually just got fifth shard this week and we're going to add six shard. So each shard has four megabytes per second of, of throughput. And so uh, pretty much, you know, we're already at um, 20. We're going to be at uh, 24 megabytes per second of throughput, which, you know, uh, for 16 megabytes, it converts to like 2.8 billion gas uh, per second, uh, not per block, not per Ethereum block per second. And so this kind of massive scale, right, allows, you know, to drop transaction fees costs. Uh, I mean, compared to Ethereum pre-dunk pre card, right, it was like <laughs> completely insane. Uh, obviously, we'll see where the price uh, going to settle uh, with proto-dunk sharding. And... Uh, but again, the biggest benefit is like this, this continuous scale 
uh, and continue expanding versus a lot of other approaches are pretty kind of static size, right? They're still writing one, one singular blockchain uh, that cannot scale beyond that. And uh, I think that really is, you know, huge benefit for anyone who's building, like they have these guarantees around kind of low price. Yeah, and just um, on this one, Ilya, um, I feel like I feel like that the that the cost of DA for near has been uh, is clearly extremely low, and if not the lowest, um, but for some reason the market reflection of of using Celestia or using all other DAs has been significantly stronger. Curious about your thoughts of, as to of the adoption of near DA and kind of how you see this uh, really coming to market in terms of integrations, reliability, dev experience, and really trying to, to put this to market and get adoption for near DA. Yeah, for sure. It's a good question. I mean, obviously, like Celestia has been pioneering the space for a long time. And so they, they have a definitely big head start. Um, the kind of general side for us is this is one of the kind of tool sets that you get by using kind of near, right? So fast finality, DA, uh, there's also work on some shared sequencers and other stuff, like all of that you get by kind of hooking into this. And then you also now looped in into kind of broader chain abstraction, like you can have a faster, uh, you know, interactions as well, faster bridging, faster communication right so the, the idea here is like it's not a standalone like hey you know i need a da but that's actually hey you're you're getting hooked in into this whole ecosystem that like really delivers a better experience for you as a roll-up and for your users and so and it's like cheaper and it's like connected to ethereum so like you have all those pieces you really working together for you and so uh, we obviously started later. We have few rollups already live. We have all the major frameworks integrated. A uh, bunch of rollups and services are also offering it. Uh, and also, we are we have a plan uh, that we're going to be announcing soon around uh, kind of interesting. I mean, go to market for that as well. So uh, a stay tuned for that. But b is you know I think to take away like it's not just da. It's like a whole suite of of uh, services for rollups that uh, otherwise you kind of need to pick and choose a bunch of different uh, providers uh, and potentially they don't work with each other and potentially like, you know, they, they don't like the kind of the chain abstraction experience, for example, you cannot get uh, yet anywhere. Uh, so that's, uh, I would say, a huge benefit that as a roll up you can do. And, and the interesting thing is you actually can do a double quorum. So because the prices right now are cheap everywhere, you can actually post them both get benefits of near still potentially use celestia eigen da uh, and uh, then over time decide what's the best product yeah awesome and i appreciate that answer i like that just kind of pick and prod a bit um uh, is there a is there a fallback mechanism for near directly to ethereum should there be some sort of reorg or halt or some sort of issues with the with the near da uh, layer um similar to to other other solutions as well um, where you know if, if there's some issue with near then then that then that roll up wouldn't necessarily need to like rework it could end up just using ethereum yeah i mean i think in in, in the frameworks that use right they have a uh, kind of back, backup if they need to but i mean generally near has been live for um in three and a half years now with we, we i mean we had some like instability in the network but did never actually like fully you know, stalled or failed in, in any way. So, um, so this kind of also provides a lot of guarantees. And this is why we actually, you know, resharded network, added more, you know, uh, we upgraded protocol, I think like 48 times in three and a half years. Uh, so we have like six week uh, kind of protocol upgrade um, kind of uh, uh, cycle. And so generally speaking, I think uh, you have a pretty good guarantees on, on, kind of network reliability and uh, uh, depending on your security uh, optionality, like even if you have some kind of additional latency or whatever, uh, I mean, this is with anyone, right? Right now in Ethereum, you, you, you either way have like a pretty kind of big room. Uh, and so, uh, and Nier does have like BFT finality. So you have like, a you know, 
as soon as you see final block, which usually happens uh, within one block from posting, you have, you know, I, at this point, like 66% of, uh, I don't know, 700 million near, which whatever the price is eight. So like you have a pretty, you know, multi-billion dollar guarantee on, on kind of non-rollback, non, uh, I'm forking that. Yeah. And I guess, I, I don't know, I'm just going to push forward. Um, so I, I, I guess just the last one is, um, what was the thought process behind the, the design choice for the, the way in which near DA, uh, functions? Um, you know, there, there's like KCG commitments, there's data availability sampling, light nodes, like what, what did new, like, how have you came to the design choice for how near DA functions and why, why don't you use data availability sampling? Yeah. So, so near itself, uh, like that's kind of, as I mentioned, like data availability is part of near consensus. Like it's, it's kind of embedded into the consensus layer. And so the design choices are all based on like, how do we put as much throughput possible in a sharded system and have the current security guarantees required. And so, uh, because of this, like the, the, like we use all the same methods that data availability sampling uses. We just use them for sharding. Right, so that all the validators in the network have the guarantees. That's why, uh, kind of cheekily, it's called data availability sharding. Um, and so, uh, and so that's kind of the guarantees. And like from a data availability perspective, on Ethereum, data availability sampling is not really helping you, right? Because like data, like Ethereum is not running data availability sampling on Ethereum. Like it, uh, you actually just anyway validating the consent, the you know the consensus of the group that uh, of validators and so near kind of provides that guarantees to everyone like hey the consensus of the group of the whole validators of the whole stake of near have uh you know seen this data even though it's sharded and kind of you know you can continue adding more shards to to scale that so that's that's kind of the it's like a, we started from a different direction like how do we scale i mean in this case data availability uh with demand so it's not limited by a single blockchain and so kind of using the same methods like it's erasure coded it's you know broadcasted across different validators but on a kind of a little bit different level of shards instead of uh kind of the way for example celestia doing it with assembling cool yeah so i mean again major major framework uh, all of the all of them are integrated um but yeah you can go to uh near the dork slash data ability or uh, near modularity, I think this is a link um, to check it out. So maybe switching gears is okay. Well, so now we have all these rollups, we have all this near, we have you know Solana, we have Bitcoin, we have Cosmos uh, chains, right? It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and so, how do you actually uh, kind of best you know aggregate navigate this? And so the idea here is. Um, we actually want to turn the near network itself into a large MPC uh, kind of multi-party computation network, which now is able to sign transactions uh, on other chains. So we're using this uh, kind of new tech around uh, um, key uh, resharing so that you know you can have validators coming and going uh, and still maintain the same uh, kind of you know quote unquote private key. Uh, uh, that's distributed. And what this, what the kind of benefit of this approach is, is that now you have a near account that has a lot of benefits, right? You know, you can rotate keys, you can, you know, onboard people really easily. We have, uh, you know, pass key and kind of face ID onboarding email and like recovery. Yeah. You can do social recovery. You can do all of those things. And now this account can be kind of a front for all of the addresses on other chains, right? For Bitcoin addresses, for Ethereum addresses, for Solana addresses, uh, Tendermint, etc. And even more, this account can actually be a smart contract. So near every account is a smart contract. And so you can have a DEX, you can have a lending protocol, you can have you know a bridge, you can have a token contract, which now has kind of presence everywhere because it can actually execute transactions there. And so this is really powerful. Uh, again, the kind of core technology here is this, uh, we call it chain signatures, which allows kind of having, you know, validator set, uh, that maintains the key shares, uh, continue, you know, move, like adding new nodes, removing nodes while maintaining the same public key that they sign. And then for each account, we then derive, 
uh, kind of new addresses. So account account itself defines which which addresses it has, and so the account then can have you know infinite addresses as well per chain. So you have like this ability to have kind of for each near account infinite amount of addresses on any chain. And the cool thing is this works with any chain. Literally, like if we spin up right now roll up, uh, like it it will already work on it, right? Because it doesn't require any integration on either side. And so this is why it's actually like. I call it unbridging because you're also like saying instead of bridging assets out of, you know, you, you, we, we launch, for example, something there, we need to now bridge it out for people to find it. Instead, you're actually getting people there, right? You're like, oh, you know, or you already can have an account and you can buy the token or buy that NFT or buy whatever, participate in that new app that's launching there. So that's kind of, you know, one of the core pieces of chain uh, abstraction is kind of really bringing users everywhere from one place and like aggregating kind of all of the complexity uh, under the hood and, and abstracting it out. Ilya, quick question here. Um, on the account aggregation, the because the user wallets are accounts and those are smart accounts, and then the token contracts are also uh, smart contracts, this account aggregation, this means that uh, the users are able to have one account across all of these different ledgers um and then it does it also mean that the tokens can exist almost like this like omni chain tokens yeah, omni token yeah yeah okay so both of those apply because of the same principle yeah or or you can have a dex or you can have a like you can have a i don't know cardano lending protocol you you put cardano into an address on cardano and then the, the near account now can for example send transaction on usd on uh, whatever Ethereum to 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 lend you some USDT, right? So kind of yeah, near is like can coordinate all those like multi-chain kind of accounts. But yeah, Omni token is really cool. Yeah, you deploy a token on near, and then it just pushes out and creates like ERC twenties, SPL. I don't know VRC twenty if you want to be a really uh, DGN. And so you now have like this the same token kind of everywhere. And like, you know, you may need to like move the supply in some way, but like it can create like a really powerful uh, kind of network effects there. Yeah, very cool to see how that happens from the user perspective and then also from the uh, chain contract perspective. For sure, yeah. Awesome. All right, so the other piece that is important that people I would say usually brush off is so okay so we have you know we have lots of chains we have you know infrastructure for kind of aggregating security and making sure they're all kind of aligned we have the account level which now allows you to navigate and, and transact on all this but now like where the hell are the apps like how to find them what's going on who is doing what is this a legit app is this going to steal all my money on all chains now uh, so how do you actually like uh, make sense of that and so we developed this uh, framework, uh, we call it decentralized front ends, which actually stores the source code of the front end on chain. So the actual, like literally JavaScript code is stored on chain and uh, it, it rendered in specific sandboxes. So it's kind of, it, it actually is secure uh, to, uh, to compose different applications in one, one experience. And so what this allows to do now is to have actually security of, let's say your smart contract and your front end to be the same. Your DAO, right, that's, that's deploying smart contract can also deploy the front end. Your, uh, you know, potentially a way you kind of maintain and upgrade and everything can be all the same. And on the flip side, you can have this kind of experience which aggregates a lot of front ends for smart contracts. And that's kind of like, I, I use this cheeky phrase, like your, app, your dApps are not dApps. Uh, because right now, most of the dApps are, are just front ends for smart contracts, right? You still need like wallets, you don't have any notifications, you don't, you know, there's no like experience built around it. And so uh, one of the ecosystem projects called DappDapp built this experience, built this app, which has 14 different layer twos, 150 different smart contracts, all of them aggregated into one experience. And so in that experience, you can go and actually uh, check out the, Kind of applications you can find new things you can see like you know there's upcoming airdrop for example tab which like uh lists what's going on so you have this discoverability now 
of experiences and you know economic opportunity across all of these chains and they they actually adding more stuff they actually launching kind of uh, more functionality every day so that's again it's powered by the fact that like each front end for each smart contract is you know can be developed separately can be like aggregated very easily um they don't need to maintain for some of this uh this themselves it's kind of like an app store right for the DeFi apps in a way across all of the web3 and so that's kind of the vision we have as like this this continues evolving we'll have more and more of this now aggregated experience where uh you know as you go through a wallet or you go through kind of one of those like gateways you're able to navigate all of the web3 you can find applications and, and experiences and then if you have a single account right that can transact on all of those chains you don't need to switch networks you don't even need to know which network like dodo is running on uh you just transact with it and you know underneath it like figures out which network it is signs a transaction for it through the through the account aggregation chain signatures sends a transaction through a gas kind of gas relayer uh you know transaction happen and then you're kind of front end shows you back the result right so like the chain actually is becoming abstracted you don't need to think about it you're just navigating experiences so the cool thing about near we've been last year focused a lot on the uh kind of bringing consumers so we have uh the most consumer apps and users uh on near and Kind of the benefit now we're bringing all of these users to all of the chains right so like part of it is you know some people ask me like oh but isn't this you know whatever stealing our users i'm like no we're actually bringing users to you like we have you know eight million uh over eight million actually monthly actives in the kai chain hot is a new telegram wallet that grew they actually are i think three million monthly actives now they grew they grew to a million in uh 10 days and i think in three million in 40 days so like insane growth, uh, they right now pretty much are transacting on near, but you know, they're planning to launch with chain signatures, um, kind of as soon as that's available. And so really bringing all of these users, um, kind of across the whole web three. And so I think that's really, a kind of benefit of, you know, we talk about mass adoption and so like mass adoption kind of already happening. Uh, it's just right now it was locked kind of in the, you know, in near and, 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 you know, reasonably so small economy. And now we actually like making it available everywhere. Yeah. And Ilya, I think that, that, uh, that's something that, that we like have talked about a bit and there's a space today about applications as a result of like the modular stack or, or just kind of like this idea of, of chain abstraction. And I was talking to kind of, uh, I was talking to Brendan Farmer from Polygon about how he kind of sees Nier's chain abstraction as like the front end and ag layer or other, you know, things as the back end and your point with regards to, okay, the future of chain in the chain extracted world, whether it's shared sequencing, whether it's ag layer, whether it's any of these kind of interoperability technologies on the back end, which users don't really care about necessarily is user ABC comes into one of these apps, then is able to then interact with these apps and then wants to use another app or wants to use another part of the system. And then automatically their, their liquidity is, is basically bridged or inserted into roll up ABC outside of just near or outside of just their initial point. And so right now in Ethereum, we kind of had this misalignment of incentives where Blast has native yield. They're trying to get as much ETH on their chain as possible and TBL and all these different things. When really, I think the future where, where you're going and, and where you're seeing is like, Look, if we can all just build these things that 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 are attractive to people, and then allow the downstream effects to flow into the rest of the ecosystem, if we can all just collaboratively do that across the spectrum, then then it's just kind of a greater chain abstracted kind of vision and liquidity for all. And so I think over the next year or so, we start to see these this uh, roll up infighting almost of like, oh, I'm CK, oh, I'm OP, oh, I got this, got that. Kind of turn its turn on, on its head to be like, guys, if we can just get a chain abstracted kind of unified roll up landscape and just do our best to go out and bring in, then we, you know, we all kind of win together for the sake of Ethereum, for the sake of near um, and broader space. Yeah, I mean, exactly. That that's really the you know articulated division is you know if we work together, we actually can like bring the best products to the users and actually attract more users. Uh, versus if we're like in fighting and you know the projects are like jumping around or like launching on all chains and then too like too distracted by 
you know, which, which chain is giving them bigger grant or whatever, like then we kind of lose momentum and we get into bear market again. Right. Uh, <laughs> so like, I think it's, it's really important to, yeah, kind of focus on, you know, how do we get a lot more users into this? And like with near, we've been focused a lot on that and kind of that experience. And then how do we make this users kind of go everywhere and make it available everywhere and then indeed you need this ag layer and you know intent and kind of orchestration all of those pieces behind the scenes to make sure that you have you know correct security you have you know nothing rolls back randomly here and there uh, you have the aggregation you have execution that you know multi-chain and so like all of those pieces need to like happen uh on the back end to power that yep totally agree Super bullish on the uh, consumer facing things that you guys are, are building. Yeah, so I mean, just kind of as a, you know, to leave you as a meme, right? Don't be a fragmented Web3, uh, kind of, you know, have lots of wallets, you have fun stuck with drawing, you know, you miss airdrops, you, you want to be a chain abstraction, Chad. Um, you, <laughs> Chad also starts with chain abstraction. Um, and so, you know, you want to see like everything in one portfolio, get every drop, you know, leverage your Bitcoin, uh, swap in seconds, any asset across all chains. So, yeah, welcome to join chain abstraction movement. Gosh, I just feel like such a, a left curve left side of screen right now. Oh, <laughs> gosh. This is my life on chain for the last two years. Yeah, it's all of us. Yeah, I've uh, been there. Yeah, I mean, just kind of, so like chain abstraction, I, I, that's what we focused on. But again, maybe just to like look look after like what's coming next because everybody's like, okay, well, chain abstraction is happening now. Like what's going what's gonna to happen next? And the, the reality is like, I think that there are going to be a change as well in how we interacting with, you know, blockchain as computing, right? So the consumer apps themselves, the, the SaaS software, the business software will also be changing by leveraging AI, by changing kind of the experience. And so... Kind of the vision we've we've been talking about it last year. Uh, it wasn't like as clear. Now uh, we got a lot clearer picture. Is like it's a self sovereign operating system, right? So like think of Web three is you know your networking stack, your peer to peer, your communications, your value transfer, uh, and then you have this front end apps that are like becoming super apps because now they can experience like have lots of experiences across all Web three, and so. What's in the middle is this operating system, right? It's what connects, you know, the developers who are building with this kind of hardware, right? Blockchains and other pieces of the stack. And uh, there's also AI modules, you know, kind of that, you know, like coordinate all this. So we have like a bunch of projects now that are generating UX, for example, and UIs uh, from your description, right? Or allowing you to like just type in, hey, mint me an NFT or swap a token or whatever and execute the transaction for you. So like the experience is changing the, you know, interactions with governance, interactions with, you know, potentially intelligent assets that are like, we have this really cool thing called shield GPT where you deposit your meme coins and then you shill it to buy more of that meme coin. Uh, and so there's an LLM behind that actually like scores how like, like should it be buying or not? And like, did you convince it or not? Right. So like you can have all those like pieces kind of really coming together into like a one vision of this uh, self sovereign operating system. And like I have a, like a whole talk uh, at this Denver actually about that. Uh, I mean, so demos like this presentation. So yeah, so check out near modular. You can like plug in whatever your framework is and see the prices comparison between different chains. Uh, Dabdab.net is for uh, for those who are wanna actually not you know run around different rollups, but actually like see everything in one place. Uh, they have quests, they have points, they have like all of, all kinds of uh, cool things. You know, you can see what are the airdrops coming. They partnered with Linea, they partnered with, I think, uh, some other base, CKVM, et cetera. Uh, I think 14, 14 layer twos for sure. I think they're adding more. Uh, Sweatcoin is the first one who's shown uh, this kind of chain abstracted, chain signature transaction. So there's a demo of pretty much buying with Sweat something on BNB. And so this is like, you know, you can literally buy, you know, I don't know, like an unstoppable domain by walking. Yeah. So you don't need to know about anything about BNB near kind of, you just receive your sweat tokens, you, you know, buy this and then underneath, like they pay, you know, in the transaction relayer for gas, there is a chain signature that signs a transaction on BNB gets relayed by a relayer uh, that pays gas on that side. And then that buys you the, 
uh, than Sogun domain, for example. Uh, and then for yeah, for those who are like developers, you want to check out uh, chain signatures use cases and more. Docu there's a docs. Um, you can go to docs.near.org and there's a chain signature section there. So yeah, I'm just uh, you know suggesting to assemble all the abstractors. Uh, it's time to really <laughs> abstract the blockchains and uh, yeah, make it make it consumer friendly. Awesome, Amelia. Thank you. Um, just going to jump into a couple questions. I think I'm just going to take the slides down as long as it's all good with Rob. I, I, I'm, I'm curious about this, this futuristic um, on-chain agents perhaps interacting with, with uh, DeFi and blockchains rather than, than humans. Um, like are, are you building near and these chain aggregation, these, um, these account aggregations, all of these kind of abstractions, are you building this for a future of humans interacting with it? Are you building it for a future of AI based agents interacting on chain? I mean, it's both, right? Like, I think the best thing to like the best way to think about it, right? No, like you don't care if the address, if the account on near is a human, a agent or a cat, right? And so they can now transact everywhere. They can actually interact in the same way. And so indeed you can have, and we, we have examples <clears throat> of, uh, kind of agents, both on chain or an off chain agent that, that has an account that can interact, right. And pay for stuff and, and kind of, uh, transact on chain. Right. And so kind of the chain abstraction really allows them to communicate across the whole ecosystem and call that three. So like the cool thing right now, if you are building like in anything in AI, like launch on near opens up this everywhere. And we have like a, you know, a few already tools to kind of enable that easier. Um, and so we see, you know, first examples and kind of toys being already launched, but also like as as I think this evolves, we'll see some really interesting kind of novel use cases on on that. Very cool. Yeah, it's uh, it doesn't matter, right? Like like you said, whether it's a cat, an AI agent, or a human, like the user experience is going to save like all three of those groups time, energy, resources. Um, if the user experience is easier. Yeah, especially for cats. I think they, they definitely cannot bridge tokens right now. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Um, outside of outside of kind of what we've talked about today, um, what what in the space is, is particularly exciting to you um, that that is, you know, relatively new as far as the last year or two? Um, is, is there anything that's really caught your eye that you're like, wow, like, I want to do more research about this or kind of lean into this? I mean, well, we touched on AI. I mean, there's a whole spectrum of AI web three things. I've been, I've been talking a lot about that and, uh, um, kind of working with a bunch of teams, um, on, on different aspects of that. Uh, I think beyond that, uh, I mean, obviously we've seen kind of a huge growth of real world assets. I mean, I don't think it's a new thing. <laughs> But I think we're getting to like a legal frameworks which work, and so now it's coming kind of becoming more and more normal thing. Um, and I think it's it's kind of interesting because I, I've heard some some this from somebody yesterday who was like, "Hey, we should not be innovating legal structures when you're a startup." And the thing is, like, that's literally kind of crypto is like a locus of innovation around regulatory kind of legal finance you know and technology coming together and like you kind of cannot do one without another and so i think like we will see a lot of interesting kind of financial instruments that you know have real world impact but have also this digital asset benefit like so one project is doing like tokenized debt but then you can turn that into like a credit union right the credit unions were kind of localized uh, entities that were giving credit to people who, you know, they probably had known or some somewhat connected so they could have a way better kind of credit system. And so now with crypto, we don't have like a uh, uncolorized loans because we don't have a way to like validate who the person is or uh, who is the counterparty. And, but if you have a credit union, like I know you guys, so I can give you a loan, but then I may not have the capital to give you, like how do I borrow against it and then maybe underwrite this loan? So like we can now build this interesting, more interesting systems because we have like more pieces kind of both connecting with real world and 
more digital asset uh, kind of DeFi primitives. So I'm excited about that kind of trend and uh, that expanding. And uh, I mean, how's that kind of start impact in real world, right? Where, hey, like actually it's easier to participate in on blockchain, again, with chain abstraction with like all of the ease, ease onboarding than it is in traditional way where I need to like, you know, now figure out a bunch of stuff. I got a question about the the integration or like the adoption process here um, to integrate and, and bring the entire industry under this chain abstraction, uh, give it that that user experience feeling. What is the process to integrate something like, you know, like an OP stack or like an Arbitrum Orbit or like, you know, is it a matter of bringing them into the same kind of like node operators, I guess? You know, you, you mentioned all of like the composability and the user experience benefits of the applications that are built using near DA and, and the near nodes. Is like, is there a conversion process to bring some existing applications into the near ecosystem? Or how do you how do you think about that adoption cycle? Yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, it, it's kind of depends. So like the way to think about it, it's a stack, right? And so, you know, the best thing, if you get all of this, right, <laughs> you get the best results, but you can start at any point. And so, so chain, chain signatures work without any integration on the other side, right? Like it, it because we, as I said, you can just push transactions into other chains. Now we still need some, you know, relayers mark, like somebody who will have the fee to pay on the other side. Uh, but that's a way easier, like kind of, you know, you're getting paid by the tokens, like market kind of market making uh, type uh, relationship. Now, uh, that kind of is a good start, but also it allows only to write. You also need reads, and so reads require some, you know, some oracles. And so there's like some uh, new protocols coming out, which are like chain abstracted oracles, which allow to bring information back. Uh, now, when we talk about, for example, DA. And, and like some other pieces, right? That obviously requires a little bit more integration on their side, right? And so again, that's why like, hey, you can start with dual quarter that allows you to start publishing on, you know, for example, even in CD and near, you can do that. Uh, and then over time, you know, you can like start getting a lot more benefits from this. So uh, so for that, we have, you know, OP, Arbitrum, StarkNet, like all of the stacks pretty much, we have integrations, they can just adopt that. Uh, if you're talking about like application, hey, I'm I'm a you know Magic Eden. Um, to start, it will be like you can uh, you can just will add something in in your wallet selector so that now this chain abstracted accounts can can log in into your app. Uh, on the flip side, if your wallet, uh, this is where like we offer kind of a, you know we're working on getting an SDK that you know you can integrate now used through a wallet can actually access all apps on all chains, right? So you now need to not need to integrate every chain independently and then figure out how to like offer your user a way to transact there. You just integrate one SDK and just work, right? So so it's kind of like on, on diff for different audiences, it's like a little bit different entry point, but then you get like more and more benefits from the stack. Yeah, that that is very helpful. And I think there is kind of like some more work to do because um, you know, if it's a matter of like, if the entry point is the wallet and it means I have to create a new wallet to, in order to have chain signatures across all accounts, like, does that mean as a MetaMask user, I need to sh send all of my tokens to a new wallet or is there like a, an integration flow where there is kind of like a, I don't know, like a peaceful transition from like a, a regular account that is, uh, per RPC to a more like chain abstraction type of account yeah and, and again it's it's like if it's uh if it's an app and you have existing like metamask and it's an app right like we're working on you know making that easy like just add one one line in app if it's a wallet that is willing to go kind of chain abstracted right they need to switch a little bit in their side now they they have so much more reach and offer right so they are like way more competitive in the market and then we have things like DabDab that actually serves almost like as an integration point, right? Where it integrates a lot of apps and it offers all the wallets, but they actually do all of the kind of connectivity, right? So then in this, in the DabDab case, DabDab does the heavy lifting 
And so any user with any wallet can come in. Anyone can, uh, you know, use with any apps to integrate it. And so you kind of offer like more of a platform. So, so we kind of have like few of these, you know, kind of shots on goal in a way in parallel, because we think like for different use cases, like the adoption will come uh, in different ways. But then also there will be apps which are like built in this chain abstracted way from the start, right? So like a multi-chain DAX that works with this in mind, like this kind of uniquely enabled, right? You, you know, think of it as like Binance 2.0, kind of the better than centralized exchange because it's fully non-custodial, but at the same time, the experience of onboarding is easy. You have access to all chains right away, right? You don't need to wait for somebody to like whitelist enable, et cetera. It's all decentralized. And then, you know, it's all uh, kind of there. So those kind of experiences will be, uh, you know, uniquely enabled by this. And we have people like building that, building like ordinals. You can or deposit ordinal, create an NFT on near, trade it, and then withdraw it back into an ordinal and Bitcoin address. Like those are really becoming new unique use cases as well. And like for us already here, these things are exciting for us from a, a principled perspective of a better experience. So for us, it's like a, it's a want. It's not yeah. necessarily a need. Like I may still contribute. I may still contribute in to on chain if the if the UX doesn't get much better for the next couple of years. Then I might be like, okay, guys, what the hell are we doing here? But for like the other people who are not really here for like the OGs, if you will, for them it's a, it's it's a necessity. And so like the process, those people won't even onboard to a MetaMask perhaps in the future. They'll they'll probably just onboard directly into account abstracted, aggregated, et cetera, wallets. Exactly, yeah. I mean, that's kind of to, to like give you a comparison, right? So, I, I mean, I don't know the recent number, but MetaMask has like 30 million uh, active, monthly actives, right? Near right now is, uh, I think at like 15 across these major like chain abstracted wallets. And so, and it's growing. And so like, um, and so the idea is like, and, and this is like, we have actually more monthly active addresses on near right now than on any other chain as well. So like cl clearly, I mean, even though the, like they say 30 million monthly actives, that's, they're not actually using MetaMask like to send transactions. They just have the MetaMask. Uh, and and I, I'm assuming, I don't know how they measure that. Um, and so like we bringing all of that users across all that three, right? And, and like those apps are growing and they're gonna grow in faster because they offer more functionality. Uh, so we kind of see that as like, hey, actually the new consumer, the actual new users are coming through this channel. Like they will not be installing like MetaMask as much. They'll be coming through, you know, sweat coins and Kai Chings and Hots of the World and Play Embers and other apps. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate the, uh, the vision. It's very exciting to kind of speak to, to like the forward-looking aspects of crypto because it feels like we're really just on the cusp of, of all of this. You know, it's like you build solutions, you encounter new problems, and you build new solutions, and it just feels like we've gotten to the point where it's like the solutions are really going to start to make like a more of a zero-to-one impact, almost like the Uniswap moment in terms of like wallet UX and unified liquidity and experience on-chain and things amongst all of this other modularity conversation. So... Ilya, very much appreciate you being here today with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.